appearance of the downtown. Uh, Mr. Williams has come to, to his present position in planning by, by an interesting route. He started out with an MBA from Stanford University. Uh, he has law degrees from Harvard University. And as he told me, he started out representing clients in the development process and realized that he was more interested in what they were doing than what he was doing as a lawyer. Uh, also realized that he was more interested in the regulation side of things uh, and in the, the point of view, the public point of view, than he was sometimes in the interest of, of his specific clients. And so at Harvard, he worked with uh, Charles Haar, uh, very important in the development of uh, a philosophical basis for uh, land use guidance, land use regulations in this country. And for 15 years has been the assistant director for plans and programs of the San Francisco Planning Commission. Before that, served as uh, an official in the Department of Housing and Urban Administration in its growing formative years in the 1960s, uh, was involved in the development of the Model Cities program at that time, and also worked as an aide to the mayor of Baltimore, a city which came from being from having a reputation as being the uh, the worst of the East Coast cities uh, to being a, a very vibrant uh, urban setting. Uh, and so he has had a lot of experience on both coasts and we're very proud to have him here to speak to the topic of downtown planning and design. Mr. George Williams. Uh, this, this clip. Well, thank you very much. It's nice to be here. I'd like to apologize first, though, for the weather yesterday. I'm afraid I'm responsible. Just before I left San Francisco, I was planning a ski trip with a friend for after Thanksgiving. And as you may know, we've had a lot of trouble with snowfall in the Sierra. So I closed the conversation by saying, I'll, I'll pray for snow. And little did I know that uh, it would, prayer would be answered quite so quickly as I flew into O'Hare, it, it, it started to snow. And then yesterday I spent wandering around Indianapolis. Some friends of mine had designed the, uh, the river walk along the White River behind the zoo in Indianapolis. And uh, I wanted to take a look at it and I went over there and it was all locked up. Uh, I guess the, the security guard thought nobody would be foolish enough to want to go promenading on a day like yesterday. But I did, so I hopped the fence and got to the end of it and turned to come back when the heavens just opened up with this bizarre hailstorm. And it was then I, I resolved either to give up prayer or be far more precise as to time and place as to when the <laughs> prayer would be answered. But I, I did survive and was very, very impressed with everything that's happening in Indianapolis. It's a uh, an incredible uh, laboratory. It, it, it looks like it's about to take off the way Baltimore did 10 years ago. Uh, I, I saw the work they'd done with the canal depressing its, its water level and it's going to be another San Antonio River corridor very quickly. The market's beginning to respond with a lot of private housing. And uh, if you want to understand uh, large cities, you don't have to come to San Francisco to study it. You have a very good working laboratory just uh, a few miles away from you. I do want to, however, tell you about our experience in, in San Francisco. Uh, it is unique and, and uh, for very strange reasons in a way where we've been thrust into the role of being at the cutting edge of, of land use regulation. Uh, I want to tell you a bit of the, the reasons why that's come to be and then show you uh, some slides of what we did in putting together a downtown plan which uh, we did really it's, uh, we spent the 80s uh, working on it it was finally legislated in, in 1985 and uh, its uh, its fruits are now beginning to pop out of the out of the ground 
And then I'd like to discuss a couple of things that, that won't be described in, in the slides and then hope to leave enough time to uh, respond as I'm able to your questions. Uh, as Dr. Parker said, people in San Francisco care passionately uh, about the place. A lot of people are there from other places. They're living in an earthquake-prone environment because they love the physical environment. And uh, they, frankly, a lot of them don't like people messing with that environment. Uh, there's a strong feeling that among many in the, in the, in the population that, that uh, by definition, uh, new development has got to be worse than the, the development that it, it replaces. And San Francisco is a very small uh, city. It's on the tip of a peninsula. It's fully developed. And every development uh, proposal virtually means displacement of some other use. And every uh, development proposal is a, a pitched battle uh, between uh, development forces and uh, anti-development forces. We also have in California an, uh, a requirement that major developments be analyzed through an environmental evaluation. Legislation that was drafted to deal with large public projects in uh, urban settings where the land was first being uh, urbanized and the, the legislation was drafted with that in mind uh, but through some court interpretations was made to apply to private development and to apply in, in an urban setting. And so we've had to experiment uh, since the legislative language is very imprecise as to how you analyze the environmental impact of an of a urban office building. Experimented over the years uh, in uh, analyzing assessments and uh, did that also in a, in a, a very litigious environment. Uh, citizens, when they don't get their, own, their way through the regular, normal regulatory process, uh, resort to the courts. So we had a city attorney and developers attorneys that were being more and more cautious, saying we don't know how to interpret the State Environmental Quality Act, so let's err on the side of caution, let's do more analysis rather than, than less. So we have a, a bulletproof uh, environmental uh, assessment, bulletproof from, in the terms of, of defending litigation. So uh, we began to really look at what are the impacts of, of commercial development on the environment and began to look at things like uh, the shadowing of high-rise buildings uh, on parks and on sidewalks, uh, wind impacts, uh, looking at the impact of, of uh, development on the transit system, on the, on the housing supply, and another thing that, that, that happened through the environmental impact assessment through the, the urging of lawyers was that they became more and more uh, conservative. In other words, you overestimated the impact of development just to, to be cautious because of, uh, if you've overreported the impact, uh, you aren't vulnerable legally, uh, whereas you are if you underreport the impact. So we have these, had these reports that were really uh, overstating the impacts of development, but it was uh, a, uh, a necessary thing to do, and, and the opponents to any growth at all were, were using those reports to raise the public consciousness uh, of, of the impact of, of growth. Uh, there also, in California, as a result of some uh, reform measures at the turn of the century, very easy access to, to the ballot. Uh, just 5% of the people voting in the last general election can sign a petition and get any, ma any measure before the voters. And that's just a matter of putting some card tables in front of supermarkets for a couple of weekends and, and you've got enough signatures. So over the course of, of uh, the years, there have been a half a dozen measures uh, directed at, at controlling or limiting uh, downtown growth. And each time it goes on the ballot, it, uh, it comes closer and closer, came closer and closer to, to, to passage. So it, in that environment, we began to put together uh, a, a plan revising the, the development controls uh, for downtown. And this was occurring at a, at a time when the, particularly the financial district, was undergoing an explosion of, of, of office development, something that 
happens, happened all around the country during that period for a whole host of reasons. Deregulation of, of uh, financial ins institutions, uh, the Tax Reform Act of, what, 1981 made investment in commercial uh, development very uh, attractive. Uh, Canadian developers uh, had run out of things to do in Canada and came to American cities in force and uh, were trying to do things. And we started the decade of the 80s with virtually a zero uh, office vacancy rate uh, because with financial deregulation of banks, uh, a number of banks, New York banks, Chicago banks, uh, didn't quite know how the deregulation would, would uh, uh, work out and they were, were gobbling up office space even though they didn't need it. So here was a zero vacancy rate and all of this, this money moving into commercial development and uh, the downtown started to explode. What had been a traditional uh, construction rate tied very closely to an absorption rate of about a million and a half square feet of office space a year suddenly took off and in a couple of years in the, in the 80s we were approving four and five million uh, square feet of office space uh, a year. Uh, so it was to get a handle on that kind of explosive growth and in, in a, that kind of political environment that demanded more planning, not less planning, uh, we put together a, a, a plan for, for the downtown. And now I'd, I'd like to run through uh, some, some slides uh, that focus more on the urban design aspects of the plan and then I'll discuss some of the, some of the uh, uh, we have a set of exactions or impact fees. We also have a, a one of a kind uh, kind of thing, a, uh, an office, a, an annual limitation on the amount of office space we can, we can approve. Uh, I didn't get the lectern light on before. Where are the uh, lights again while we find the, uh, the buttons well, here. here? Is that one? No. Okay. Okay, let's see. Uh, okay. There's a switch. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hmm. Okay. We need the good question. We need the controls for the for the projectors. Oh, I, they did the remotes. Uh, not, okay. These are the controls. I just okay. need the light. Oh, you just oh, you need the light. There we go. Okay. okay. All set. Sorry for the delay. Slides, please. Oh, I'm sorry, I've got to aim this. Don't I? Something very strange has happened. Oh, okay, I've got that upside down. That's what's happened. Perhaps. San Francisco has always been an urban place. Streets are precisely defined by buildings standing shoulder to shoulder. Can somebody reposition that? I'm not. Can you maybe turn it this, the, the, the remotes, turn it this way? So, or do, do I have to aim this at each projector? Or do I, I aim at the thing in the middle there, don't I? Maybe, yeah, maybe you could turn that a little bit, so, yeah, I, I think that may pick it up a little better. Streets are precisely defined by buildings standing shoulder to shoulder at their edge, facing the street dressed in formal, respectful attire. Hmm. From the beginning, its urban qualities were so pronounced that California, did that one switch on the right at that time? Hmm. 
From the beginning, its urban qualities were so pronounced that Californians from one end of the state to the other referred to San Francisco simply as the city. Up until the 1950s, cupolas, domes, finials, balustrades, slender building tops softened the presence of large, bulky commercial buildings on the skyline. The net effect of these added small features was to make these larger bu buildings fit harmoniously with their diminutive neighbors. Hmm. I'm sorry, I think I'm going to see. The skyline of downtown thus shared many of the qualities of other parts of the cityscape. And in a city of hills where downtown buildings are seen against a fine scaled backdrop of residential buildings on nearby hills, that is important. I think we're getting there. There was a conscious attempt to, attempt to coordinate design efforts to achieve an overall effect. Belt courses, for example. Belt courses, for example, were adjusted to reinforce the lines set by the few good surviving buildings. Bold projecting cornices. You know, should have a, another bold projecting cornice there somewhere. <laughs> Maybe that, there's a bold projecting cornice. Bold projecting cornices, bold enough to be seen in our imperfect peripheral vision, framed and defined a human scaled street space. And although quite different styles were often employed, because of shared traits, the buildings worked together to a common effect. The net result was a city well suited to the needs of the pedestrian, the daily user of downtown. Most important, the early architects were not just creating buildings, they were assembling strong, richly endowed street spaces and streetscapes. Streets of this kind offered new rewards with every visit. Neither individual buildings nor their combined effect can be fully absorbed in a glance, but invite, invite repeated study and examination. There are always features or qualities not observed before. Up through the 1950s, San Francisco retained its delicate skyline and cohesive streetscape. Then forces for change Radical change began to mount. The old skyline was quickly hidden by variations of the slab end and the standard box top, off, box top office tower. Without small scale features providing a visual linkage with the scale of the surrounding city and imparting a human liveliness to their forms, their aggregate effect was often contrary to the character of the surrounding city. At the street level, the new buildings ignored their neighbors and offered little of the qualities that give, street, that give scale and visual richness to the street. Citizens discovered that their cherished views of the bay and city were not guaranteed. The whole form and character seemed, of the city seemed under attack. Then a series of threatening mega projects along the northeastern waterfront surfaced. There we go. Uh, triggering a citizen revolt that helped secure adoption of the downtown urban design plan in 1971 and limits on the height and bulk of building. Okay, there's the citizen revolt in all its glory. Uh, Uh, 
Okay, the, this is the urban design plan. The height and bulk controls succeeded in stopping the proliferation of view blocking slab towers and superscaled projects, but were inadequate by themselves to secure building forms uh, sensitive to the context. In many other ways, new development ignored existing patterns and characteristics of their surroundings. Stronger measures were clearly needed. To protect the qualities that make San Francisco's downtown unique, moderate the rate and ultimate amount of growth, and assure that new development will, en will enhance rather than detract from the city, the San Francisco Department of City Planning proposed new rules and standards for future development. The rules were adopted after long public debate in 1985. A fundamental premise of these new rules is that great cities are not built by tearing down fine old buildings, which in San Francisco were being lost at the rate of seven or eight a year. only to replace them with less distinguished efforts. I'm sorry, these are some of the fine old buildings. I, I'm gonna have to turn this way because every time I punch this, it doesn't necessarily mean a slide has advanced. So, 250 buildings of the highest architectural importance are now protected from demolition except in the most extreme situation. San Francisco's new preservation controls, however, mean much more than the protection of fine old buildings. They mean the conservation of a unique urban environment. Conservation, not as a lifeless museum piece, but as a vital functioning part of the city. Almost the entire retail district uh, and five smaller areas in the financial district are designated as conservation districts. Here, there are incentives to preserve 183 buildings of somewhat lesser quality, called contributory buildings, which together with the more significant buildings, together with the more significant buildings create areas of unique quality. Here new development will, is closely controlled to make certain the new buildings fit and do not detract from the scale and character of the area. The plan's preservation policies are made workable by allowing the transfer of the unused development potential from the sites of architecturally significant and contributory buildings to other sites within downtown where new development is more appropriate. The scheme is based on a measurement called floor area ratio, which is one way we control the volume or density of a commercial building in San Francisco. Floor area ratio, or FAR, is a multiple of the size of the development site. The FAR varies from zoning district to zoning district. For example, if the FAR is 6 to 1 and the size of the development site is 10,000 square feet, this means that one could build a building whose total floor area that is the total square footage of all floors, is six times uh, that of the, the lot area, or 60,000 square feet. This also means that one could build a six-story building containing, uh, covering 100% of the lot, a 12-story building covering 50% of the lot, and so on. This total floor area, which is a multiple of the size of the development site, represents the development potential of the site. Our preservation system works this way. Assume that the building on your right covers 100% of a 10,000 square foot site and that the FAR is 6 to 1, so the total development potential of the site is 60,000 square feet. Assume also that the, the building we are requiring to be preserved, uh, which is the, uh, the lower half of that building on the right, is only three stories and its total floor area is 30,000 square feet. The difference between this actual floor area of 30,000 square feet and the development potential of 60,000 represents the amount of unusable development potential that can be added to 
transferred to and added to the a development on another site. So, uh, this concept of the, of the transfer of unusable development potential, unusable because we're requiring the smaller building to be retained, uh, is the keystone of, of, of the plan. Uh, we now call this unusable development potential transferable uh, development rights. And this uh, is, is used to achieve the preservation of, uh, of, of buildings that aren't required to be retained and it, in a, a way as a measure of compensation although we're not required to provide compensation, uh, it is a measure of compensation to those owners of, of smaller buildings that are required to, to retain them. The, the TDR scheme also enables us to shift the focus of new development from the already dense north of market area uh, where architecturally important buildings are concentrated to an underdeveloped area uh, immediately south of the high-rise core. And you can see that area uh, just below the, the uh, cluster of high-rises there that's full of, of underutilized uh, old industrial buildings uh, where the, uh, there's no interest in, in saving those buildings and where it would be appropriate to allow higher densities and heights than, than the then current zoning would, would allow. Under the new rules, we, we allowed higher height and density in that area, but not as, as, as a function of, of owning the land. You had a, a, a lower FAR there than we ultimately wanted to, to see realized on the land. But a developer there can develop at that density only by, using, by, by purchasing the unused development potential from the sites of the preservation buildings uh, to the north that we are, are mandating be retained, or we're trying to provide incentive uh, for their re retention. Working with economists at the Environmental Simulation Laboratory at the University of California at Berkeley, uh, we analyzed, when we worked very closely with them putting together the plan, and we analyzed where the next 10 million square feet of office development would be likely to occur under the old and new rules. And this is what would happen under the old rules. The, the line down the middle is Market Street, and the highly developed north of Market area is to the right, and the less developed south of Market area to the left. Uh, you can see most of the buildings are still concentrated in the, the to the right or the north of market area, uh, and they are rather sizable. Now this is, hmm, this is what would, would happen under the new rules uh, we propose, the uh, simulators predicted. Dramatic shift uh, south of market, uh, the buildings uh, are smaller, more slender. Uh, we've now had three years of, of experience under the new rules, and in fact, the market is, is uh, responding precisely as, as we predicted. And the TDR scheme uh, remark works remarkably well, and it's all done uh, in the private sector. The government does not get involved at all except to uh, record the transfer of development rights uh, and, and, and see that that is in the, in the chain of title so that, that uh, the, the restricted development side is permanently restricted and, and uh, the developer has insurable title to, uh, to the building with the, with the higher density achieved through the purchase of transferable development rights. The man-made canyons of a high-rise center can be exciting, vital places to be as long as you can easily get to a sunny, comfortable open space. The plan is premised on the principle that no one should have to walk more than 800 feet to find some kind of pleasant outdoor space. The accessibility of diverse forms of recreation and settings contributes to the richness and satisfaction of living in the city, uh, living and working in the city. On a warm for San Francisco day, a sunny park can be delightful, but on a windy, foggy, or rainy day, available weather protected. Hmm. Here we are. Okay, 
on a, on a warm for sunny San Francisco day, a sunny park can be delightful, but on a windy, foggy, or rainy day, availability of a weather-protected arcade, greenhouse, or galleria would be more enjoyable for many. Open space does not always have to be on the ground. A sunny terrace high on an office tower can offer an, an exciting alternative to more traditional open space. At less exalted elevations, open space is also potentially exciting and successful, provided public access is obvious and it possesses the qualities that will make it attractive to the public. Because adequate open space is important for a, a livable downtown, the, the plan makes its provisions mandatory, on-site if possible or off-site. And as the chart indicates, uh, depending on what kind of a zoning district you're in, uh, you have an open space requirement that's a function of the amount of office space you're providing. Not a percentage of, of, of your development parcel, but a, a function of your total development, because that your total development indicates the number of employees and visitors that will be attracted to the site and uh, is a more accurate measure of, of the demand for usable open space uh, that's, that's required. We allow a variety of types of spaces to qualify, plazas, terrace, arcades, galleries, atriums, even conversion of alleys uh, to pedestrian malls uh, on, on public space because there are some sites downtown where it doesn't make sense to have on-site uh, open space. So we're, we're realizing uh, our pedestrian network uh, that we developed using uh, public rights of way by having individual office developers uh, do a portion of that pedestrian network if we conclude it's not appropriate to put the open space on the side of the building. The requirements for acceptable open space are designed to make them more usable by people rather than simply pretty things uh, to look at and to show off the building. The requirements include minimum standards for seating, sun exposure, public access, wind protection, and food service. These requirements will prevent <coughs> these kinds of substandard open space in, in, in the future. And on, on the left is, is just a magnificent uh, public plaza that uh, is designed to show off the building, not to serve people. It is placed on the north side of the building and is constantly in shade as, uh, as you see it now. The largest amount of open space in any downtown is in its streets, and when these streets are attractive and inviting, they too lend themselves to recreational use. San Francisco's retail district is nestled close by the office core, offering many workers the alternative of a shopping trip or window shopping during the lunch hour. Streets in the retail area are relatively sunny and bright because of the many smaller buildings mixed in with somewhat larger ones. The presence of sunlight and the comfortable scale of the buildings contribute to a pleasant pedestrian experience and is considered an important in ingredient to the continuing commercial success of the area. It assures that many buildings in the area designated for preservation will be saved within a context that respects their, their scale. The to protect this area, we dramatically reduce the allowable uh, height limits. Uh, the slide on the left are the height limits we legislated in 1971. And you can see much of the area allows heights up to 300 feet, although the prevailing height of buildings there is, is approximately 60 feet. Uh, we changed the zoning to set the, the, the base height at 80 feet uh, with the possibility of going to 130 feet, but only uh, if the additional 50 feet did not, does not block required sun access on spe specified street, does not contribute to uh, to significant shadowing and respects the scale and pattern of, of, the, uh, of the street wall. We also scale down the heights uh, throughout the downtown area. And uh, on these slides, the, the, the darker the color, the higher the height. 
and you can see on, on, on the left uh, that the heights were much greater going up to uh, 800 feet in the, the, the blue area in the core. The height districts are also uh, rather wide. We wanted to achieve a number of, of things in revising the, the, the height plans. And again, we were working not in a, in a no growth mode, but, but a, a, a control, control growth mode, trying to uh, allow the kind of growth that economists uh, indicate would, would happen, but to do it in a, in a much more sensitive way. And we, we worked with a, uh, a, a, an old three-dimensional scale model that uh, had been done in WPA days as a, as a make-work project been languishing in a, in a city warehouse. We gave that to the Environmental Simulation Laboratory uh, at Berkeley, and they had the students update the, uh, the, the, the scale model, uh, putting in all the development that occurred since the, the Depression. And then we worked, uh, again, this, this seems like the dark ages. I visited your, your uh, computer lab today and, and saw some of the new equipment doing all this on, uh, on computers. Uh, we were doing it with uh, three-dimensional little wooden models. But we had the, the, uh, the Berkeley students design buildings under, under varying rules that, that, uh, that we were testing. Uh, worked with a, a real estate economist who indicated where development was likely to occur. We would put the model building into, the, into this model of the downtown, uh, look at it, and the, the simulator at Berkeley has a little camera that can go down into the model and, and, and simulate a, a pedestrian a, a experience. Uh, and we refined our, our height plan in that way. And one, one of our objectives uh, was not only to accommodate the appropriate level of, of development, but also through height to replicate uh, another San Francisco hill uh, with, with, with high-rise development. And you'll see at the, the close of the slides, uh, the model that, that, that shows exactly that, how, how another 20 million square feet of office development built under that height plan uh, would look visually. Not as graphically apparent, but dramatically affecting the scale of future development are the reductions in the floor area ratios governing the amount of development that may be placed on a given site. The permitted ratio of development to land area was reduced in all parts of the downtown from a base of 14 to 1 in the financial district, and you had a potential through uh, amenity bonuses to get as high as 25 to 1. We reduced that to a, to a flat 10 to 1 and eliminated all density bonuses. And the retail district, we reduced it from uh, 10 to 1 to 6 to 1 uh, and so on. Another issue to be dealt with was the shape of buildings. Uh, it was clear that as formulated and applied, the 1971 uh, bolt controls, while preventing slab-shaped towers, were inadequate to prevent high-rises widely perceived as being too large, as overwhelming, or the, the most appropriate epithet, most appropriate, appropriate epithet the anti-growth forces could, could muster was these high rises were Manhattanizing the city. And that became a big political battle cry during uh, the debate over these controls was uh, we don't want to Manhattanize San Francisco. It was not so much their height as the intrusive and uncompromising form of the box shaped towers. As skyline features, they formed harsh compositions. Their flat tops fought the vertical thrust of the hills and the delicately scaled tops of the older buildings. The typical box-style building, however fine architecturally, makes no gesture to street scale or the contextual needs of meritorious older buildings. Their bland, repetitive facades did little for the definition and enrichment of street space, nor did their shape respond to concerns about sunlight and air. Bulk controls cannot address all these problems directly. But to the degree they can lessen the stranglehold of the box top tower formula, it facilitates a more responsive architecture. And we discovered, as we were formulating the, these rules, that a very key member of the development of the team, probably an equal partner with the, with the architect, was the leasing agent. 
and uh, the leasing agent wanted as much square footage as high in the sky as, as possible. So that, that uh, and of course the developer wanted as inexpensive a, a building form as possible. So the international style suited those needs uh, perfectly. You, you did a, a building that was 20,000 square feet at the base and it, it, it went straight up with no setbacks, uh, no, no articulation of the facade and you had the same 20,000 square feet at, at, at the top of the building. Uh, to break the box form and generate an upper tower form more on scale with a cityscape, uh, the top 37% of towers over 200 feet high uh, are restricted in the new controls, uh, are restricted in mass to the equivalent of a modestly scaled building typical of many older apartments and office buildings in the, in the city. The portion of the upper tower so limited is diminished as the height of the tower drops below 220 feet and no upper tower reduction is required of buildings less than 160 feet in height. To encourage even more slender tops, a 10% increase in building height above the height limit is offered in exchange for a decrease in the volume of the upper tower. In effect, the developer transforms square footage into smaller uh, but more numerous floors. A side setback is also required starting at one and a quarter times of the width of the abutting street. The intent is to assure a reasonable spacing of towers and allow sunlight and air to adjacent buildings into the street. The requirement affects both the bulk and placement of buildings. The bulk control formula is not in itself a formula for acceptable architecture, merely the starting point. It is the designer's task to massage the volume about within the permitted averages and come up with a coherent, graceful design. And there are an infinite number of ways this can be accomplished. Uh, if the rules prove too restraining in a specific case, they may be relaxed, provided the basic intent of the rules is still achieved. And we had a, a, a long dialogue with the local chapter of the IA when we were putting together these rules. They were concerned that, in effect, the bulk rules were designing the building. And, and we worked with them to the point where the more creative architects realized that, in a way, the bulk controls were to their advantage because it, it broke the economic imperative of the box. They now had latitude to do creative design. The bulk controls set the, 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 the envelope in which good design uh, could occur. And uh, I think most people feel comfortable with, with the rules now and believe they do not uh, dictate design, but as I indicated, if there is a problem with a particular site where you can't get a decent looking building within the rules, uh, we have the, uh, the ability to moderate, to modify the rules. San Francisco's temperate coastal climate makes two possible impacts of building form, shadow and, and uh, wind current. A particular concern since the loss of sunshine or the creation of ground level wind currents can turn a pleasant pedestrian environment into a very unpleasant one. The plan addresses these issues in a number of ways. In some cases, requirements that buildings not encroach on a solar access angle have been imposed. In other cases, shadow studies will be mandated to establish a building form which will reduce the amount of shadow the building will create. Now, both of those buildings have the, have the same uh, cubic square footage, but obviously the one on the left uh, creates far more shadow than the, the one on the right. City parks and squares receive even greater protection as, as a result of a, a public referendum. And as we were putting together this plan, there was a, a building that was approved by the Planning Commission that created uh, some shadow in a public park. Uh, so the card tables went out in front of the supermarkets uh, midstream of the planning process and the voters adopted a rule that says no building over 40 feet high uh, can cast a shadow on a, on a public uh, park or open space if, if that shadow will have an adverse impact on the use of the park. And uh, obviously a, a very uh, strict rule and we're, we've been working again with, uh, with UC Berkeley uh, again, for the first time coming into, the, into the, the 1980s, developing a computer program that will enable us to simulate 
uh, the shadows on, on public parks created by a new building and uh, be able to quantify the amount of shadow, which gets very tricky, obviously, because you not only have a hilly topography in San Francisco, you've got to consider the height of, of, of buildings around that park, and then uh, physics uh, tells us that the sun doesn't stand still. So the shadow is, is constantly in movement from, from minute to minute, uh, day to day. And, and simulating the, the, uh, the, the shadow has, has been a formidable task for the computer programmers. Uh, before we had have that computer program, we, we uh, did it the old-fashioned way, developing solar fans uh, around various parks. Uh, the, the one on the, uh, on the, on the left is uh, just the, the solar fan around one park. Uh, the one on the, on the right takes into account all the parks uh, downtown and all of the, uh, the various impacts of, of, uh, of, of shadow in, in, in different parks. And that, that represents the solar fan. That, that's, that, that solar fan represents the, the height under which, uh, if, if you're under that height, no shadow will be, will be cast. In other words, anything higher than the height shown on that solar fan uh, would create shadow. With respect to wind, performance standards were set, uh, and wind tunnel tests are now required on all new proposed development to determine whether a proposed building form will meet the standards. Uh, if it does not, we we'll, we we'll require changes in the in the building form, and uh, the performance standards are based on on comfort levels uh, at the at the ground. Uh, an area where people are walking can t can tolerate greater winds than an area where uh, where people are are sitting, uh, and this is getting to be a rather sophisticated methodology. The, the, there are a number of of uh, wind tunnels uh, in consulting firms and at the university that uh, have proved to be quite accurate in predicting what a building form will do to wind currents. The results of all the planned proposals uh, were carefully tested. First, by the real world as, as uh, developers and their architects were coming in with uh, building proposals uh, during this office boom, uh, and then we simulated likely development uh, at the simulation laboratory uh, at Berkeley. And here, on, on, uh, here in model form is San Francisco as, as it is today, or as it was three years ago. Uh, Now here is how it might look in the year 2000 with uh, projects that are going through the approval process and projects that are likely to be uh, approved to the, under the downtown plan to the year 2000. And you can see on the right how we really have filled out that hill form. Uh, you, the, the, the lighter color buildings are new developments. You can see how the development uh, has shifted uh, to the right, that's to the south, uh, that's the direction we wanted the, uh, the movement to go, uh, the development to go in. Uh, and that's San Francisco as it is today. And that's the end of the slides. Could I have the lights please? Francis, I was going to talk a bit briefly about our exactions and, and uh, office limitation program, but I see it's about 10 minutes to 9. Should we stop here and take questions, or should I do that quickly? Why don't you just very quickly sum up those measures? Okay. Uh, exactions you probably know about. It's just one, one thing to say about our, our exaction package. We have, as a, as, as a part of uh, the plan, requirements that downtown office buildings uh, contribute 
$5 a square foot of, of office space for transit, uh, $5.75 for housing, uh, $2 for a public park, uh, $2 for childcare. Now, when we first proposed those controls, of course the, the development community around the, the, the country uh, squawked and you know, thought it was un unfair or un-American or unconstitutional or, or what have you. Uh, but we could very clearly demonstrate that the new development was, was creating impacts on the transit system, on the housing, housing stock. We could, could justify them under, under uh, constitutional principles requiring a, a, a nexus between the development causing harm and, and the, the correction of, of that harm. Uh, uh, so we thought we were on, on very sound grounds in, in terms of, of, of there being uh, fees that would mitigate the impact of, uh, of that development. Uh, and what, what made them unusual conceptually is that, that we were creating those kinds of impact fees in a, uh, in a high density uh, area for the first time. But in California and, and, uh, and, and many other jurisdictions throughout the, the country, it's very common in, in uh, uh, suburban residential development to require the developer to put in streets and donate a site for the school and, and provide parks. And, and we're, all, all we're doing really is, is applying the same principle, uh, but, in, but in a different setting. Uh, I think conceived that way, our, our uh, developer exactions seem uh, a, a bit less uh, radical. Something that, that probably is less e easily rationalized is something that happened during the, the legislative process. It was not a part of the original set of controls that the planning department had, had, uh, had proposed, but because of this strong anti-growth sentiment in, in San Francisco, uh, there was concern that even though our development controls reduced FARs and, and would, would slow down the, the, the pace of office development, uh, those controls were indirect and there really needed to be a direct control. So the, the Board of Supervisors, which is our equivalent of a city council, uh, passed the plan with, with a, a, an annual uh, office limitation uh, attached to it, uh, limiting the amount of office space that could be approved every year to one million square feet a year in the face of what traditionally had been a million and a half square feet of space absorbed every year. So it was a reduction in the amount of space uh, that, uh, that could be approved. Uh, with that attached, the vote, uh, the, 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 the plan passed on a six to five vote. Now you would think normally, given all of these regulations, that the five votes would have been voting against it because the, can the plan was too strict. As a matter of fact, four of those five votes were because the plan was not strict enough. Uh, and anyway, the, the, the uh, the no growthers were dissatisfied with what the legal pro process had produced. Uh, the card tables came out again, and uh, uh, lo and behold, there was a, a measure on the ballot uh, that that passed 52% uh, to 48%, that reduced that square footage we can approve every every year to 475,000 square feet. And w the planning department is now in the in the in the business of rationing office space, and we annually hold a competition. All the developers who want to develop office space uh, compete uh, and, and we, uh, we have to determine how that space gets uh, allocated. A, a, a challenging job. There are some general kind of qualitative criteria in the, uh, in the ordinance as to what we're to look at. We're to look at, at uh, which project uh, does the best job in advancing the policies and objectives of our master plan. We have a, a, a policy plan that, that covers lots of things from encouraging transit use to uh, providing affordable housing. Uh, it's a very comprehensive plan and we have this, this evaluation scheme that looks at each policy that's applicable to office buildings and, and try to rank order. We don't rank order the buildings but we have a, have a, a, a scale excellent, very good, good, poor, and try to rank each building before us uh, against 
the, uh, the, the master plan policies. And this gets very difficult because it's not like looking at competing proposals for the same development site. This office limitation applies throughout the city and you can have proposals in very different, different sections of the, of, uh, of the city. Another criterion we've had a, a lot of trouble dealing with is one that essentially means uh, you look at the need for the office space. And we've, we've done this, this uh, competition twice. The first year, we took that uh, in, in, in its literal meaning and actually looked at the need for office space. And that got us into a, uh, assessing the, the, the market for office space, looking at, at uh, uh, sub-markets, class A space versus class B space, uh, prime executive office space versus back office for, for uh, clerical workers, uh, sub-markets based on, on geography. Anyway, it got to be a headache. Uh, and then we began to look at what, what establishes a need. We read all the literature as to what is, a, what is an appropriate vacancy rate for commercial office space. We then, because of this, this uh, explosion of development, we're looking at a 16% office vacancy rate. And we concluded that based applying that criterion, you can't justify the need for, for any of these buildings be, being approved. Uh, and we said that. And then uh, another criterion that has been even more troublesome is uh, the architectural quality of the building. Obviously a very subjective criterion and very difficult when you are, are looking at diff different, uh, different sites, uh, serving different needs. Uh, obviously uh, a, a uh, an executive office building in the, in, the, in the heart of the financial district can afford uh, you know, a marble skin and a back office uh, development uh, out, in the, out in the boonies is going to be a very different looking building. But we had to take, take into account good design for the, for the context and, and the type of space. We also realized, given the subjectivity of that judgment, that we as staff couldn't uh, uh, couldn't be making those kinds of judgments and making them stick. So we, uh, we did the, the usual, uh, bring in the, uh, the outside jury of, of uh, preeminent uh, critics whose, whose, uh, whose views could not be uh, assailed. So we brought in Jerry McHugh, who is the chair of the, the Graduate School of Design at Harvard, uh, Dick Bender, who was dean of the College of Environmental Design at Berkeley, Tim Vreeland, who was on the UCLA design uh, architectural faculty, uh, previous chairman of that department, uh, and had them uh, look at these buildings as a jury. And then we had uh, a long public session. We had a scribe recording all of these, uh, all these critical comments, uh, and then published that report. And uh, they didn't like any of the buildings that much and, uh, and said so in, in, in rather unguarded terms because they were, you know, they were being academics and it was like a student jury and, and kind of flip remarks, particularly Jerry McHugh said some unfortunate things that the scribe took down and it got, it got reported. Uh, anyway, they said they didn't like any, any of, the, of the buildings so the planning commission that, that has to make the decision ended up approving none of the buildings. Uh, so we ran the competition the following year uh, with many of the, of the uh, same buildings, uh, looked at assess needs somewhat differently. Again, it was, it was uh, something we don't feel totally satisfactory uh, with, but it worked given the buildings we had in front of us because we had, we had enough space to approve three buildings. We had four buildings before us. Uh, one was, was an institutional developer, uh, somebody building for their own occupancy. Two of the buildings were almost fully pre-leased, and the fourth building was just a spec office building. They didn't have anybody lined up. Well, you assess what's the need for the space, the spec office building uh, drops out. The architectural quality, we again use the, uh, the eminent outsiders, uh, but rather than bring them in just as a, as a jury, we, we brought them in to critique the building uh, while they were being designed. So the designers had an opportunity to respond to the uh, critique. And we brought in Bob Campbell, who's the architectural critic for the Boston Globe. Uh, 
and uh, Bob Geddes from Philadelphia, uh, Princeton University, and used Dick Bender again. Uh, and brought them in twice during the design process, and they're there with their comments were very helpful and improved the design of the buildings. And then the, se the second time was they, not as, not as a, a, a panel, but individually, just assess the strengths and weaknesses of, of uh, individual buildings, and that just became another couple of pages in an elaborate staff evaluation report, really downplayed the importance of, uh, of that. The, 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 the first time we did it, the jury, in effect, became the decision maker. Uh, redoing it had the, uh, the architectural critics uh, or, or, or jury, uh, not, as a, not as a panel, as, as individual, and their opinions varied, and it became it was presented in a way that, that the planning commissioners could disagree with the, with the judgment of the jurors. And that worked uh, much more satisfactorily. And we're just gearing up for our, our uh, third panel. And uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll end up doing it uh, even differently. It's a position we feel very uncomfortable in. It was not, not uh, a role we wanted to assume. And uh, I don't recommend uh, an office ra rationing system to anyone. So I'll, I'll end there and be happy to answer Mark Rule for the base of the building. See, uh, with the office, the gap in the office space, it's not something that you would suggest somebody else get involved with, but you think it's all the city? Well, it's, it's too early to say because we're still working off this, this vacancy rate. So it, ha hasn't, it hasn't impacted the economy. Uh, that much, even though we're, we're not approving as much space as we traditionally absorb. But as I say, we're working off, off this, this vacancy rate. I think we're getting better designed buildings. And what's good for the city it really depends on your point of view. The no-growthers no will say the best thing that could happen in the city is that it not grow anymore. Uh, other people predict uh, doom and gloom if, uh, if we chase office development to Los Angeles or, or, or Oakland. And it's the kind of thing where we'll probably never really know truly what its effect is, will, will be because locational decisions are made in boardrooms in New York or Chicago. Uh, we aren't privy to those discussions. We will never know what development might have come to San Francisco and elected not to because they, they couldn't be assured that they would get a building approved or when they needed to expand, they, they would have the opportunity to expand in San Francisco. So I don't know what, uh, what impact it's, it, it, it's, it's going to have. It would be a good uh, PhD dissertation for somebody to go out and try to, uh, try to measure that. Pardon me? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, the way. A lot of cities are still doing it. We, when we redid our, our downtown controls in the, in, the, in the 60s, again, we were being very avant-garde in, in trying to get various amenities in downtown office buildings. And we would give uh, additional FAR, in effect, additional density, if you did a plaza or you provided a connection to, uh, to the subway system or you did an arcade, which, in effect, widened the sidewalk. Various things we thought were desirable for, for, for downtown, uh, at that time we felt could only be achieved by allowing the developer more development in exchange for, for providing uh, those, those amenities. Uh, we made a fundamental decision when we did the plan this time that if that kind of amenity was, was important to have, it should be required and not, in effect, bought through selling uh, density allowances. Uh, so that, that's what we've done. Again, a lot of you, you can do that sort of thing if you're a, a, you know, a growth community, a, you know, your economy is booming and you have a, a, an active citizenry, many of which say, we don't want any more growth anyway. It's, it's, it's easy to put on those kinds of requirements because people still want to build in, in, in San Francisco. And uh, should it chase away development, there would be a large number of people that would say hooray. I'm sorry?
I'm sorry, I still can't hear you. Oh, the TDR. Yeah, the, we, we've uh, approved three buildings uh, in round two, and we have four in round three, and all of them have used TDR, or proposed to use TDR. Uh, so it, it, uh, it does, does work. Uh, the, interesting, though, that the, 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 the value of, of, uh, of TDRs is substantially lower than, well, it, it, it compare it if, when you buy a pre piece of property, it comes with, a, with an FAR. You can translate that to a, 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 a floor area foot in, in, in the building. Our land prices are such that you're paying about $50 a square foot of, of buildable floor area in, in, in the building. Uh, the market price for the TDR is around $20 a square foot. Uh, and that's, again, a function of law of supply and demand. There are all kinds of sellers of TDR. Uh, buyers are limited to those people who are prepared to, 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 to build. Every owner of TDR is a seller. There are very few buyers, so the, the market price is, is, uh, is lower. Yes. Yeah, but we again uh, we were operating with 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 the notion of, of of what's fair, and rather than than doing what's called wipe out windfall, uh, the, the the nice older buildings north of market that we wanted to preserve uh, constitutionally under the Penn Central case, we could have simply said, cold turkey, you. Uh, you have to retain those buildings, even though there's still unused development potential on on, on those sites. Uh, that that would be the wipeout. And in the area south of Market, where it was uh, zoned at a, at a much lower density, we simply could have upzoned that area, creating windfalls there. The TDR scheme uh, enabled us to uh, equalize that. So uh, yes, there was more development potential south of Market, uh, but you didn't create that development potential uh, in, in, in a way that would have represented a windfall to those owners. They have to buy that additional density from the owners of these buildings that, that are required to be retained. When you drastically decreased the height limits, wasn't there a court challenge to that, arguing that that was a taking, was it the Haas case? Claiming that that was that was a taking of yeah. development. Well, that that was an earlier case on, on on Russian Hill, where there was a dramatic lowering in height from I've forgotten the precise figures, even, even more dramatic than what we did downtown. It went from like 400 feet down to 60 feet, and uh, the court held that that was not a was not a taking. That there was still uh, reasonable value, reasonable use that could be made of, of, of the property, even though significantly diminished. And the constitutional test is uh, if there is a reasonable use uh, left of the property, it is, it is not a taking, and you can, you can uh, enact the, uh, the, the reduction simply through the exercise of the police power. Any other questions? Well, I apologize for, for, for the weather and the, the slides being somewhat out of sync, uh, but I've enjoyed talking to you very much. Thank you. <laughs>